Everybody, I just want you to know we are video recording tonight's program. Uh, we find these programs are really great and not everybody can always join us, so we want to have our programs available on our website so people can see them at their leisure. Okay, so hopefully our filming will work tonight. Um, we're going to get started. We have a big program tonight on Linda Hewitt. I do the adult programming for the library. I'm going to talk to you just about a few of our programs. Um, this is a really important program. I want to just say that tomorrow, somebody from NJLA, which is uh, the National Library Association, is featuring us in the NJLA uh, newsletter magazine. Yes. And this is going to be read by librarians across the State. So hopefully other communities will embrace this and, and do a similar program. We can't have enough of these programs across the state. The state. So that's really exciting news for us. Um, in addition to this program, the Red Bank Public Library has tons of programs. The adult programming um, is ranges from yoga, we have belly dancing, we have mahjong, we have bridge. We are starting our walking tours again. In the spring, we do historic walking tours, and they last about an hour and a half. We're going to be adding another tour, which will be the west side of Red Bank coming up. Um, we're also going to be having next year a fundraiser and have a house tour. And this house tour will be about the diversity and also the local history of Red Bank. Uh, in addition to these programs, we're bringing back meditation, which will be the second and the fourth Saturdays every month. It's either 10.15 or 10.30 that's still being discussed. Again, all of these programs are free. Um, it's a little bit sexist, but in May, we're going to be doing a ladies' tea. This will require registration. You could come with your mom, you could come with your aunt, you could come with your daughter. If age is 12 and up, they have to be able to sit younger people for a tea and experience it. Um, so that should be wonderful. That will be registration <coughs> required. Um, and also we're starting a new series. Uh, it's a, a sustainable, I don't know those of you that saw it, Sustainable Red Bank. It will be like the race program, it will be held on a monthly basis. It's going to be uh, led by Matthew Hirschberger, who works at the library. Um, I'm gonna let Matthew say a couple words about it. This is kind of we joined together tonight, so we could have this program on env environmentalism, but also hit Matt's program will be speaking about important environmental issues at every single program, which again will be held, what is it, the second Tuesday? That's the third Tuesday. The third Tuesday. So I encourage you, pick up a flyer, do come. <coughs> it should be a really good program. And as obviously you're all interested in environmentalism, it's something that we should all be interested in in our communities. So I will give you Matt um, and talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so just uh, real quick, this, is, this event is part of a bunch of uh, oh. Earth Week stuff that's... Awesome, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I forgot. I'll, 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 I'll give you yeah, a So we're doing a bunch of Earth Week events this week uh, in Red Bank. Uh, the next one coming up after tonight is the Red Bank Townwide Cleanup. Uh, we're going to meet here at 8.45 in the morning on Saturday, and we're going to go to a bunch of different public places around town and just clean up litter. Um, so that's uh, one thing that we've got happening. That's going to be for most of that morning. If anyone wants to not show up at the parking lot and just do their neighborhoods, that's fine, but we will have bagels here. Um, and they're, for, uh, they're donated, actually. Yeah, donated yes. from uh, uh, the egg, bagel oven. Ba bagel oven, so yeah. So, yeah. Um, then on Sunday, we have the Earth Day Expo, which is done by the Environmental Commission in town. Uh, that's going to be from 1 to 4. They've got a bunch of stuff going on. They've got a seedling giveaway. Uh, they're going to be doing uh, gardening Q&A, a bunch of demonstrations, information booths. Uh, we'll be there at the library. Um, and then also this live music in the Red Bank Police Department is actually doing a food drive for lunch break at the uh, food pantry in town. So if you have any canned goods or not perishable items, you know, bring those to you. Um, the other thing is obviously the Sustainable Red Bank. We have a really good one for the first one next month. It's with Sustainable Jersey. We've got a few people coming in. We're going to talk about what is sustainability because a lot of people hear that and it's kind of buzzword but they're not really clear on what it is. Um, we have a survey over there. Um, these programs only really work if we have the community involved in telling us kind of what they think we should be talking about. 
Uh, so it's just you know things that you might be interested in seeing if you would be interested in coming to those events um, from now on. Uh, we're hoping to kind of you know split off from let's talk about race, which has been just this re really great program here, and kind of expand out into, into more topics that are relevant to people in town. Uh, and unlike a lot of stuff that focuses on on the environment and climate, our goal with this is to try and give people solutions for stuff that we can do in town, rather than just it being all bleak and we're all going to die. Um, so, if, uh, if anyone could fill out the survey, that would be great. Um, so, to start off tonight, um, Roy Meyer is going to be our moderator. Uh, he's a member of the Red Bank Environmental Commission since 2016. Um, he worked in uh, academia for, in, uh, in genetic toxicology for eight years. He uh, then spent over 30 years for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection um, and also spent nearly 15 years as an assistant professor in the Rutgers School of Public Health. Um, so he's going to be uh, leading us tonight, and the topic is environmental racism, and I will let him take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming tonight. The last time we did something like this, there was a torrential downpour, and there were five people, <laughs> only one of whom apparently was not related to somebody who was talking. So it's really good to see more people. Um, Matt mentioned that you know my, my background, uh, at least recently, one of my lives was a is a professor up at Rutgers in the School of Public Health, and the area that I specialize in is environmental health. And when I first started, I looked at the syllabus, and it was the topics you might imagine. There was a section on air, there was a section on water, there was a section on soil contamination, and so on. And I said. What's missing here? And it was environmental justice. It hadn't occurred to the folks that had put that curriculum together that that needed to be a separate topic to be discussed. The assumption, I hope, was that we would, as you know, lecturers, interweave it into what we were talking about. But the reality check is, is that you really do need to have that as a standalone. Because once you get involved in environmental health, and, and the, the impact of materials in the environment, you start realizing that there is an intimate and very real link between environmental damage and race and poverty and other situations that need to be explored and put into context. I had a student early on that said, well, you know, if this is going on around these people, why don't they just move? <laughs> So there was, it was a long hill to get up. I'm happy to say now that it is part of the curriculum. It's part of what we do. It is a big part of where we're supposed to be going in terms of discussing these issues. What are the impacts on populations that are being affected? Not just are we making improvement in air quality, but where are we making improvement in air quality? And, and if I may, I'm just going to go over a couple of highlights. Um, if you go back into the history of regulation, I spent 30 years of my life in the Department of Environmental Protection here in New Jersey as the uh, bureau chief for the pesticide program. And so we dealt with regulations on a regular basis. What part of our regulations were dealing with these kind of issues? Well, realistically speaking, from EPA's point of view, just in air, places like Pittsburgh and Denora, Pennsylvania, Denora is, the, is famous in the 40s and 50s as being the town that had no high noon. There was so much soot in the air that it was black and the street lights were on 24 hours a day. Um, Butte, Montana, <coughs> site of a copper smelter. Uh, and Butte is down in a valley. So you can imagine what the air quality was for the people, the workers at the plant, the people who lived in the city down in that valley did not happen. And unfortunately, what happened a lot in Butte due to the weather conditions is that there was always an inversion going on. So the air didn't move. And so the, the impact of what came out of the smelters manifests itself disproportionately in the people in the lower socioeconomic classes, i.e. the workers, the people who were actually at the plant, and therefore laws were put in place, regulations were put in place eventually that EPA enacted that there had to be a way to control these sort of things. Pesticide regulations were designed to protect workers, but they were also designed to protect the people that they were living in the homes. If you go down to Florida today, 
somebody who can be contracted, say you're renting a condo, somebody could come into your, your condo and just walk in while you're sitting there having breakfast and start spraying because Florida's laws are that lax. In New Jersey, we don't let you get away with that. There has to be notification. There has to be notification to your neighbors if they request it. There's a whole series of things that are done to make sure the community is aware of what's going on and, and more importantly, how it's being done. And there's also the aspect of removal of our past uh, problems. Uh, lead in homes, whether it be in the pipes, whether it be in the lead paint. And those, again, are disproportionately located in communities of color, in poorer neighborhoods. And they are also the disenfranchised politically groups that don't always have the voice. So when we look at this sort of thing, it's not a great surprise that you come up with a situation as you find in Flint, where local government decided they were going to do something a little different. They changed the way the water was being supplied. What's the problem? We're still getting water. It's not a big deal. Stop complaining. Well, the reality is, is that it was a big deal. It is a big deal. And it is a sort of thing that lends itself to these kind of discussions. It's something that we've made great improvements on, but we still have a long way to go. So with that as an intro, I have two quotes I'd like to read you. Teddy Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents. This country will not be a permanently good place for any of us to live in unless we make it a reasonably good place for all of us to live in. The second quote is from Danny Glover, who knew the actor could be, be quotable. If we talk about the environment, we have to talk about environmental racism, about the fact that kids in South Central Los Angeles have a third of the lung capacity of kids in Santa, as compared in Santa Monica. Those are the realities that we, we, we are faced with and that we, we need to be able to address. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, Greg Gorman. Uh, Greg spent a 37-year career at Picatinny Arsenal. Um, if you need a howitzer toad, this is the man that knows how to do it. He was on his CV. I had to say that was one of my best ones that I've had in a long time. But in more relevance, he's involved in a lot of organizations, Sierra Club being the most noteworthy, but there's a lot that he is involved in, and he's going to be talking to us about Sierra Club's policy and environmental racism. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if all of you recognize uh, Sierra Club. Number one, Sierra Club is a club, and the thing we do best is have fun. Uh, it was uh, organized over 100 years ago, uh, primarily as a hiking club. It was very restrictive. The only way you could become a member of the Sierra Club was to be invited by somebody and sometime around the 50s it started opening up and became more inclusive. Uh, <clears throat> Sierra Club is, is not your picturesque uh, uh, type organization that, that uh, is inclusive, uh, but we're working on it. Uh, anyways, the, uh, what I'm going to try to do is, is give you a little history of uh, the brief history of environmental justice here in the United States uh, and then following in terms of the policies of Sierra Club, uh, how climate change uh, affects uh, uh, communities of, of color and, and, and poverty and, and talk a little bit about solutions. Um, the, uh, from, from the perspective of uh, the United States, uh, it wasn't Quite a while, uh, I mean, uh, there was a study done back in 1987, uh, and it was basically spillover from a lot of the civil rights uh, movement from the 60s and the 70s. And the 70s was sort of the uh, birth of uh, a lot of environmental regulations, uh, NEPA, uh, establishment of EPA, Clean Air, Clean Water Acts, and a whole slew. You know, and it wasn't until the 80s, you know, when uh, uh, ministers uh, got together in, uh, in North Carolina um, and they were focusing on uh, toxic waste issues. Uh, 
uh, and, and race, you know, which basically those were the communities they were doing, addressing. Uh, over the next decade, um, they, they started a movement and, and it gained momentum, uh, and the group started uh, demanding government action uh, to ensure that the hardships of pollution and environmental degradation would not be further imposed on any community, especially those already facing discrimination. Uh, in 1984, President Clinton executed an executive order uh, which directed each federal agency to make achieving environmental justice part of its mission by identifying and addressing as appropriate disproportionately high and adverse human health or environment, environmental effects of its programs, policies, and activities on minority populations and low-income populations. <coughs> Currently, the, we, we still have a focus uh, movement. Why don't you set up your classes in uh, Rutgers? Uh, the late 90s. See? You know, it's, it's, it's this whole movement is, is relatively new. You know, it's late 90s, that's 20, 25 years ago. Currently, the movement consists of extensive formal and informal network of community, national, and international organizations, which provide a new framework for addressing some of the most pressing environmental and social issues facing us today. I'm going to give you an overview, and then when Junior gets up, he's going to focus more on some of the issues here in New Jersey, you know, to give you some real-world application to that. This is basically the policy. All right, this is a statement from John Muir. John Muir. Um, is anybody familiar with him? Uh, he was two questions <coughs> in, the, uh, in the high school uh, proficiency test a couple years ago, you know, when they were celebrating the 100th uh, uh, anniversary of the national parks. Uh, one of the things John Muir is known for is tying himself to a tree during a snowstorm uh, just to see what the tree experienced during that type of event. Uh, he was... Uh, <laughs> Phrase I, I, I see most often is from he was in wonder about he hiked and, and traveled all over the, the country and all over the world. He's been to China, India. Uh, one story is is that he went to uh, Alaska, uh, had a severe cold, and went out on the glacier, laid down, and, and, his, and his concept was that uh, there's no microbe that's going to be able to survive, you know, from, from the uh, United States to survive on the glacier up here in Alaska. And sure enough, you know, he disappeared in the cold and so. uh, The other thing is, is uh, he had a uh, very good appreciation. He, he, he lived with the Indians. He was originally from Minnesota, and as he traveled across the, uh, the Rockies, uh, uh, he, he had stayed with some of the tribes, and he was always appreciative and really honored the idea of how they were able to, to walk without causing any harm to nature, uh, how they were able to take some of the most basic and rudimentary plants and animals and, and, and get their protein and get their starches out uh, you know, from, from what we would consider weeds and stuff. Um, but he was a uh, he was a product of the age, you know, and he, and he still felt that uh, White man was superior over that, you know. So, you know, I, like I say, he, I don't think he would be considered a civil rights type action person. Uh, but he did recognize that everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. Uh, I live out in Sussex County in the land of. Uh, Tea Party people and Republicans, and I'm Democrat. My wife was a Democrat, you know, and I always tell them, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican, we all breathe the same air in the same world, you know, and, and so that's that's the basis for everybody, you know, and that's our connection with everybody. In 2001, uh, Sierra Club established uh, environmental justice principles. I'm not going to read these to you, they're basically self-evident. Um, but they're focused on, on the clean, healthy environment for all people. Um, we have special emphasis to support Native people, uh, particularly wielding their uh, sovereign powers. Uh, most of the treaties in Canada and the United States uh, 
basically give them a lot of authorities. You know, you just don't go in eminent domain and then take their property and they have other projects and, and they become very strong advocates, you know, from an environmental perspective. On the other hand, uh, the natives have been uh, suppressed for hundreds of years uh, and, uh, and, and they tend to get uh, taken advantage of. Um, I guess recently in New Mexico, you know, there was a big push by the fossil fuel people to try to sell and salvage their big uh, coal power plant. And uh, the natives there, in this case it was the Navajo, have a very strong affinity towards Mother Earth, uh, voted it down. You know, and so that's uh, one of the hundreds of coal plants that Sierra Club takes credit for closing in the past couple of years. Uh, we support an end to pollution and we follow what they call a precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle is if you don't know, if you're going to introduce a new chemical or a new product and you don't know how it's going to affect somebody, don't introduce it. You know, they, Caution is, is if you got questions about it, wait until you get the answers, you know, before you, you know, and, and, and they apply that not only just for chemicals and pollution, but, but also in terms of uh, developments and uh, uh, you know, basically developments and, and, and immigration and uh, all sorts of issues. Environmental racism, these are basically uh, uh, some issues of, uh, of how African Americans, Hispanics are affected uh, by environmental hazards. Uh, and basically, you could read those, but as he said, these low poverty, uh, basically living areas that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, either property is cheap, they move in, or property is cheap and the polluting industries come in. And uh, he gave some tremendous examples. Uh, uh, he's going to address one in uh, uh, Secaucus, you know, with the Meadowlands Power Plant. You know, to me that, uh, not only from an environmental perspective and an EJ perspective, uh, but if you look at the Rutgers climate analysis, uh, even if they're half right in terms of sea level rise, that's going to be underwater by 2050. Mm. There are other disproportionate impacts. <coughs> there's issues with lead, there's issues with uh, Disproportionate amount of pollution that occurs. Uh, Gulf communities uh, are poisoned by cancer causing industrial chemicals, particularly from the petrochemical companies. Um, inadequate sanitation in Alabama, uh, probably going to get a little worse. You know, we've already seen insects uh, and other animals moving further north as climate change comes up. Hope corn is one of the things, Zika virus. Doing a presentation in two weeks uh, to another group similar to this, you know, they want to know what's the impact of, uh, of uh, climate change in Sussex County. Uh, Sussex County has the largest concentration of dragonflies, different varieties of dragonflies in the country. And the reason for that is because we got so many lakes and they breed mosquitoes. And so the number one thing that impact is going to be we're going to have a tremendous increase in mosquitoes, you know, not only because of the warmer waters, but the longer season in which they, uh, they can have to propagate. Uh, you know, he talked, mentioned something about the uh, natural, I grew up in uh, western Pennsylvania. Uh, and, uh, my uh, grandfather was a coal miner. Uh, my father-in-law was a miner uh, in the Clearfield, and, and that was, in fact, uh, my, my niece, lives in Clear, Clearview uh, in Bedford County, which is one of the first fracking uh, operations, you know, and so she saw firsthand what it was doing to the water and, and to the environment and everything else. Uh, and 
basically, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that because one of the things that Pennsylvania has that uh, a lot of the uh, states do not have is what they refer to as the Green Amendment. And basically the Green Amendment uh, in Pennsylvania says that everybody uh, is entitled to a clean environment and, and as a right. Not as a privilege, but as a right. And they use that to overturn some legislation, particularly some legislation that, that uh, handcuffed doctors from disclosing uh, information on uh, chemicals uh, that were affecting their patients uh, that were a result from the uh, fracking operations and then some other things. Now, I mention that because there's a proposal here in New Jersey that's being pushed by the Delaware River Keeper, the NCR Club, and a lot of other environmental groups that address the Green Amendment in, in New Jersey. And, uh, and that's something that uh, if, if that were there, then that would give a lot of strength and power to some of these uh, communities that are, that are suffering uh, from uh, pollution and, and other sorts of uh, varies from the environment. This is just a summary of some of the climate change impacts. Uh, rising water temperatures, changes in precipitation, increases bacteria, virus, parasites, harmful algae growth. Uh, we had a discussion this concept of the algae growth, uh, particularly in some of the ponds uh, and, and probably in these back bays, you know, uh, in, in Florida, they're having a big problem with uh, the red tide. Um, but the same thing is happening, you know, all across the state. You know, we've uh, basically uh, all these communities have green acres property that have nice little ponds uh, that uh, a lot of communities just can't afford to take care of. You know, up in Sussex County, we have a lot of lake communities, and they spend a lot of money dredging, you know, silt and stuff that to fill this out. Uh, one of the communities, Newton, uh, has a uh, Lake Morris up on Sparta Mountain. And Sparta Mountain is where they're doing some uh, what I'll call clear cutting. Uh, but they had their forester do a uh, what they call a seed tree treatment, which basically is cut all the trees down except for a couple here and there, you know, and the theory is, is that they'll spread their seeds and grow. Well, when they did that, uh, not only did that warm the water that was running off, uh, but it also released a lot of nutrients into their uh, into their lake. Uh, and that lake was used in their water system uh, to purify it. They had to add additional chlorine to the water uh, to kill the bacteria and to kill, kill the algae. Uh, and that reaction, the chlorine, caused a high level of cancer project, uh, cancer producing chemical, uh, and uh, DEP came in about midsummer and told them to stop, uh, and they flushed all their their water in their whole system, you know, before they could declare it safe, you know. And now they've had different filters added to it, but it costs a lot of money, you know, and it's not, I mean, at that point, because Newton is not what I would call an EJ type community, but it's the same type of issue. And this was something that was kind of interesting. The, the impact of climate change uh, not only affects physical health, but also your mental health. Um, and that's primarily, and I wasn't aware of this, for instance, uh, school buses um, that uh, emit diesel fumes. Uh, because of the way the buses are designed, that diesel fumes get sucked into the cab, okay, and the children Number one, start getting sicker. Uh, they lose, uh, lose some days of school. Uh, but more subtly, you know, they lose some of their ability to retain memory. And uh, what we've been advocating on the Sierra Club is, is another piece of legislation uh, to advocate the uh, school districts to start converting to electric school buses, which don't have that problem. I think the legislation we're pushing is asking for a couple million dollars to buy uh, 
three or four sets of uh, electric school buses so they can run some tests. Uh, I do know that uh, electric school buses in California and Massachusetts uh, are slowly being adopted in Vermont and some other places, and if they're being adopted in the north, why not here in New Jersey? Global warming has a major impact on existing health conditions. And the reason why I point these out is that if you would take a comparison of low income uh, and uh, racial communities, uh, typically they have already a high degree of diabetes, heart conditions, and what climate change is going to do is, is to make that even more acute. You know? And there's a whole list of things here. Um, and this uh, COPD, uh, there, I guess it was a uh, article in the Star Ledger the other day, <coughs> the COPD, or that was asthma. They had a big map on the front page. <coughs> I think it was COPD. And I was surprised, not really, but in Sussex County, they were one of the top five or six uh, that had a percentage of COPD, and, and whether that's coming from, there's only two big pollution points in Sussex County. One is a truck uh, trucking firm that uh, has a lot of traffic, uh, but the other one is a natural gas compressor station in Wanage, you know, and uh, across the uh, border uh, closer to Warwick, uh, there's another gas compressor station in New York. And that plume is all coming down, you know, and it's, and it's sad because when I first started with Sierra Club, we worked to shut down the general and power plant uh, that was just south of Portland, Pennsylvania. Uh, and and that, that power plant uh, was built in 1949 or 59. Uh, it was grandfather, so it never had scrubbers. And, uh, and it was polluting, and I think. One of the reasons why we were successful is uh, a lot of people don't realize about Chris Christie. Um, he is a uh, he's an asthma victim, you know, and, and the plume from the general power plant extending into Morris County as well as into Sussex County and in places in Pennsylvania. What can we do? Well, money's everything. You know, I mean, uh, first question that they asked IOC about how we're going to implement the Green Deal, where are you going to get the money? You know, uh, and that's the same thing with this. Uh, the other thing is making it clean energy more accessible. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, recently, uh, BPUs, uh, uh, I guess they're in the process of issuing regulations to allow community solar so that even though your facility, your house, your resident doesn't have the right structural things to put solar panels on, um, this community solar would allow you to buy or purchase or come into some sort of agreement so that you can uh, get the benefit of generating clean energy, getting your electricity at a lower price. And, and, and reaping in some of the prof profits. Uh, in Sussex County, we have a Sussex Rural Electric that's not subject to the BPU. And I think there are other rural electrics across the state. In Sussex County, they're already starting. They've, they've uh, reached out to some solar developers up in the county, and they're offering uh, uh, the solar community program and in the process of uh, asking for landowners or people with big uh, roofs and they're looking for a quarter acre here, a quarter acre there to do that. But that's one way of getting uh, uh, communities involved in, in providing clean energy. Uh, the other thing is, is to focus on uh, uh, programs that would uh, rebuild these communities, you know, to bike lanes to connect with uh, places, bus stops or, or train stations uh, to maximize uh, 
uh, the use of uh, mass transit uh, or to build walkability, you know, communities of walkability. Uh, and those are opportunities that you can interject clean energy as the grid gets better and so does the uh, transportation costs get better in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, the other thing is, is disaster preparedness. A lot of the uh, EJ communities are located along uh, what I'll call well, rivers, you know, along the rivers, uh, the low communities uh, in, along the shore. Uh, typically, they're in, in areas that are susceptible to flooding. They don't have the infrastructure to uh, lock things up. Uh, uh, I guess New Orleans is the best uh, example. Um, those those uh, EJ communities were devastated for, you know, as a result of hurricanes. But it's the same thing here in New Jersey. Uh, and the other thing is, is the nature-based infrastructure, forest, coastal wetlands. Uh, there have been studies that uh, for you know, setting up uh, Areas that uh, uh, the wetlands along the uh, the coast uh, may be a better solution than, than putting up the walls, you know, because it not only absorbs some of the force of the uh, uh, storms, uh, but also acts as, <coughs> as a quicker way to recover. Anyway, that's it for me. And I <laughs> okay, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Junior Romero, who's with the Central New Jersey, he's the Central New Jersey organizer at Food and Water Watch. Uh, he's involved in uh, fighting fossil fuel infrastructure projects, advocating for state and federal transition to 100% renewable energy and protecting clean air and water from corporate polluters. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, happy folks, uh, again, Junior Romero. Uh, we, I'm with a very small environmental group uh, here in New Jersey called Food and Water Watch. Uh, uh, we are, uh, we've been in New Jersey for about eight years and been uh, a, a national force for the last, uh, since 2006. Uh, we focus on issues relating to renewable energy production uh, fighting fossil fuel infrastructure projects, which I'm going to get to uh, very soon. Uh, we started off focusing a lot on food issues, particularly how agriculture uh, and factory farms pollute our water and, uh, and our air, um, and, uh, and yeah, a, a whole host of other issues. Um, but, uh, but our big thing is community organizing, uh, giving uh, all of y'all the tools uh, to go to your own communities, uh, tools and trainings to go to your own communities and advocate for bold progressive environmental policies, um, uh, like some of the ones that we're going to go through right now. Uh, so uh, uh, environmental racism is definitely something that hit home, hits home for me. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm not from Jersey. If you can't tell from my non-Jersey accent, I'm from California, um, and uh, particularly Southern California, Los Angeles, which I think was mentioned earlier. Um, it, about 40 miles east of Los Angeles is where I spent most of my childhood place called Pomona, California, in case anyone's been down there. Uh, but basically, in Pomona, California, uh, the town is about 95% uh, Latino, uh, and I'm Latino. Uh, and then around Pomona is fairly wealthy towns. You have the Claremont Colleges, if you've ever heard of those. Uh, and then just other wealthy towns. But in the middle of that is Pomona, where I live. And Pomona, uh, we had uh, a garbage um, facility that was coming to town in the latter half of my high school years and uh, it's actually the first time I ever got involved in anything environmentally uh, we didn't have uh, there wasn't much environmental education when I was growing up in school uh, but this issue really activated our community they wanted to build this uh, trash facility uh, trash and recycling facility uh, right next to an element elementary school uh, and we we researched this company that was coming in uh, they just had some bad track records in making sure the odors were uh, retained and didn't go out, uh, that they've gotten people sick, these, tr these trash facilities in other areas of Los Angeles County. Um, so my community really just got angry that they were building this in our town while they're 
or all these other great towns that, the, that this trash facility could go to, just happened to come to our majority Latino town, majority immigrant uh, town of Pomona, California. Uh, so anyways, we started a petition drive uh, in my, I think I was 16, uh, back in high school, and, uh, and uh, we forced it on the ballot, uh, and, uh, and fortunately we didn't, we didn't win at the ballot, uh, but we forced it to a vote, um, and, uh, and unfortunately now it's, it's there. So I, I want just to start off with how uh, environmental racism is, you know, it's a real thing, and uh, uh, we're gonna show some examples there, but even, uh, even in my community, I've gone through it myself. Uh, and uh, well, let's talk about some of the positives. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, here in New Jersey uh, and in Pennsylvania, um, there are many examples of environmental racism, particularly with fossil fuel infrastructure projects like power plants and pipelines, compressor stations. Um, uh, even aside from that, um, uh, communities of color are the ones that are gonna be the most impacted by climate change. Uh, I've done some canvassing in Atlantic City. Uh, you look at some of the, the buildings in Atlantic City, you just see how high the water went uh, during Sandy. You can still see the watermarks on people's buildings. Uh, people's homes, they have to put stilts on their homes um, because they know there's gonna be another storm um, and it's gonna hit Atlantic City. Very large African-American community. <coughs> um, uh, many Jersey Shore towns, uh, even Red Bank, high Latino population as well, um, like the community that I grew up in. Uh, so Pennsylvania, we did this study uh, that shows how many power plant, uh, how many power plants uh, and fossil fuel facilities correlate with uh, where communities of color are. So this is a map of Pennsylvania. Uh, the red is where communities of color are, are very highly concentrated, and uh, the, um, the sort of greenish uh, is where uh, there is current power plants, and the blue is where uh, power plants have been proposed. And in Pennsylvania, uh, they've never seen a power plant that they didn't like. So we could just assume that it's gonna be built. So let's just assume this is the full map of power plants uh, in Pennsylvania, at least in the next two or three years. Um, you can just see uh, where there are black and brown communities. Uh, there's a direct correlation to uh, uh, fracked gas uh, or oil power plants. Um, uh, what comes with that? Formaldehyde, benzene, carcinogens, uh, methane, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, Cancer-causing chemicals, chemicals that mess with people's reproductive, um, uh, with their reproductive systems, with their neurological systems, uh, with their endocrine systems. Uh, all of this is being concentrated in uh, areas where, uh, where people that look like me uh, live, and I think it's very unfortunate. Uh, and these are just our neighbors in Pennsylvania. Um, just another map uh, that shows economic, uh, the economics of Pennsylvania. So where there's uh, high poverty rates uh, of over 20% uh, in communities. That's the, uh, the checkered areas. Uh, the same, very similar, uh, there's many power plants uh, proposed or currently uh, in areas of high economic stress. Um, so just a map there for you. Uh, this is a, a big map on Philadelphia. Um, so again, Philadelphia, a very diverse area, including some of the suburbs around it. Uh, high, high concentration of communities of color, uh, but also a very uh, high concentration of power plants uh, in the area. And the, the circle is either uh, just a high concentration of power plants, or how far the pollutants uh, reach uh, from those power plants. Um, and you can see it fairly encompasses a good amount of Philadelphia, uh, including the community of color suburbs uh, around Philly. And this is just on the other side of Jersey, folks. Um, so I included in our study, uh, the purport, this one on the left shows a proportion of census tracts within three miles of existing power, whoops, within three miles of existing power plants by race. So um, uh, you are, for a, uh, for a community that was in the green, a community that's more than 30% uh, people of color, uh, they are more likely to be in a community with a, with a power plant or affected by a power plant's pollutants uh, than, a, than a white community. Uh, uh, here on the right uh, just shows um, uh, the poverty rates. So if you are over 
20% uh, in the poverty rate. Uh, we also have statistics of unemployment. Um, uh, then you are very much more likely to have two or more power plants uh, than, um, than if you did not live in a, in a high concentrated poverty uh, location. So I, what I'm really trying to show you is the, the stark concentration, the stark correlation between uh, being a person of color and living or being a, a poor person uh, uh, and being close to a power plant that's going to poison your family. Uh, so we know climate change uh, is here. New Jersey is going to be on the ground zero uh, for climate change. Um, so why are we approving power plants like Pennsylvania is approving? Uh, why are we allowing gas compressor stations uh, that uh, equate to thousands of cars being put on the road uh, in a single day? Uh, uh, why are we doing that? In fact, New Jersey is supposed to be uh, the environmental leaders um, uh, especially after many years of inaction. Um, uh, power plants, compressor stations bring, again, just some very toxic chemicals, but methane uh, that comes from even gas uh, power plants and compressor stations uh, is 80, 80 plus times more powerful greenhouse gas than is even carbon dioxide. So even, even though New Jersey is moving off of uh, carbon or coal, uh, we, there was just an announcement of cl closing down a, a coal plant in South Jersey, uh, we're still approving uh, fossil fuel uh, power plants, compressor stations that come from fracked gas. And we, a lot of us know here that fracking uh, in Pennsylvania, where this gas originates, pollutes people's water, uh, makes people sick, uh, puts people in the hospital. Um, and I don't think we should be supporting that. Uh, but unfortunately, we are. New Jersey has already approved uh, one gas compressor station up in Roseland in North Jersey. Uh, the SRL gas pipeline uh, in the Pinelands uh, has already begun construction. It hasn't started putting gas, but it's being constructed as we speak, uh, tearing up the Pinelands roads, um, toxifying our, the pristine waterways in the Pinelands forest. Um, so New Jersey's ground zero for climate change, but it's also ground zero for fossil fuel uh, expansion. Uh, even though we're not fracking in New Jersey, uh, we are pretty much fracking by building the pipelines and power plants um, uh, to burn all that gas. Uh, and, uh, and we're building the future infrastructure to, uh, to offshore a lot of this gas, right? Maybe New Jersey will eventually pass a ban on, um, on the use of fracked gas, but that doesn't mean we're not going to create a pipeline that's going to be able to export it to Europe uh, or build a LNG terminal like the one they wanted to build off of Red Bank a few years ago that we stopped, uh, luckily, with, uh, with grassroots opposition. Uh, so this is just a full list of the fossil fuel infrastructure proposals right now uh, that are uh, under state review. Penn East Pipeline is one you may have heard of. The Nessie Pipeline is a pipeline that would go through the Raritan Bay, uh, endanger marine life like seals and whales, uh, as well as the Bayshore tourism industry that is uh, slowly but surely recovering um, and putting uh, food on people's tables. Um, just, I, I won't read the full list. But uh, one I, I will talk about a little bit more in depth is the Meadowlands Power Plant and uh, how it's affecting uh, Latino pop population uh, up in North Jersey. So just, just take this all in, 12, about 12 pipelines and power plants uh, being built right under our feet. So the Meadowlands Power Plant. Uh, quick show of hands, has anyone heard of this? This has been even? Cool. <laughs> uh, so, um, Pretty much, the Meadowlands Power Plant is would be the largest climate polluter if built uh, from New Jersey. So not necessarily the biggest particulate matter polluter, but certainly the biggest climate polluter. What does that mean? <coughs> it will put the most amount of methane within a single year into our climate uh, than anything else in New Jersey, any of the refineries, any of the, the factories, any of the current uh, power plants or compressor stations. Uh, the Meadowlands Power Plant would be the biggest climate polluter if built. Uh, it's up in North Bergen. Uh, North Bergen uh, is a uh, predominantly Latino population. Uh, it's in a county currently that is uh, uh, graded F by the American Lung Association. Uh, for, uh, unfortunately, that's not even unique in New Jersey. There's a couple of counties that are graded F by the American Lung Association here in New Jersey. Uh, high rates of pediatric asthma, adult asthma, COPD, lung cancer, cardiovascular diseases. Um, 
and now they want to build this power plant uh, to add on onto all of that. Uh, just a little bit about what this power plant can do. Uh, but this is this is all just within a single year. So 3,500 tons of uh, carbon dioxide into the air, 423 tons of carbon monoxide, uh, particulate matter, um, 70, 70 tons of methane, 52 tons of sulfur dioxide, 1,000 pounds, uh, oh, that should be tons, 1,000 tons of benzene, um, what was the other, there was another one, I thought that was acid or something, oh, ammonia, 262 tons of ammonia into our air. Uh, wouldn't you all love to have some ammonia uh, in your air? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, just a little bit about the North Bergen demographics. 73% uh, Latino, again, community like I grew up, uh, very diverse. Um, I don't know if you all saw the Alien play uh, that went viral uh, a few weeks ago, but um, there was these high school students, North Bergen actually. Uh, this is a picture of them here. Um, uh, Latino students mostly. Um, but this power plant is being built in their, uh, in their community just a few miles down from uh, where they did this amazing play that, uh, it's a movie I love, Alien, you should watch it if you haven't. Uh, but anyways, uh, we just think it's very unfortunate that they're proposing this project. Uh, all the gas would go to New York City, uh, or the energy, sorry, the energy would go to New York City, uh, but the gas is coming through New Jersey, through a pipeline in New Jersey, uh, being burned in North Bergen, uh, all to give energy to New York, uh, who says they don't even need the energy. Um, so, uh, I think we might do questions at the end. Let me just hold for a second. Uh, so, one thing you can do is just call your governor, tell him to stop it, call the NJDC, tell him to stop it. Uh, but I'll have something at the end uh, that you can see there. Uh, so, a little bit on the Nessie, the Nessie pipeline. Uh, it's, it is a 23 mile pipeline through the Raritan Bay, uh, but also it is a gas compressor station, 32,000 horsepower. Uh, that's a lot of horsepower. Uh, um, they want to build the compressor station in Franklin Township, which is, I live in New Brunswick, so it's a town right over. Franklin Township is the 12th most diverse community in all of New Jersey, or 12th most diverse municipality. Uh, just a little bit about the demographics uh, here. 36% um, white, 26% black, 22% Asian, 14% Hispanic, and then of uh, Thirty percent of the population is foreign-born in Franklin, uh, and just shows you a little bit about the demographics of the foreign-born population uh, in Franklin Township. So, very diverse community. Uh, and they want to build this gas compressor station there. Uh, right behind the gas compressor station is this Buddhist vihara. Uh, it's actually a, a Sri Lankan temple. Um, it's home to the largest uh, Buddha temple in the eastern seaboard. Uh, so, if you ever get a chance, go and check it out. It's in Franklin Township. It's called the Buddhist Vihara, um, but it, unfortunately, uh, these folks, Sri Lankan folks, uh, uh, who come here to worship in, in peace and tranquility uh, in a forested area, uh, are going to be uh, now hearing a 32,000 horsepower gas compressor station that's going to blow down uh, methane and carcinogens and benzene and radon um, at least once a week, but will run 24 hours a day and uh, poison their air, potentially poison their groundwater. Um, there's a school there, it's going to disturb uh, their studies, their meditation. Um, I've, I've, been, I've walked through there uh, many times and uh, this is just, the, just one of the conveyances of how New Jersey is really ground zero uh, for these uh, pipeline, compressor station, power plant projects. Uh, and we need to stop. Uh, the Newark incinerator. Uh, some of y'all might know about this, the Kodanta, if you've ever walked, uh, sorry, driven through the turnpike. Uh, and you've smelled this just awful, awful smell if you had your windows down. Um, so I like to have my windows down when I drive, but unfortunately it's impossible to have your windows down while you're passing the Kodanta facility. Um, and I think we all know, oh, that's just a picture of it. Can you get it? Um, Newark is obviously a very diverse area. Uh, Newark folks uh, uh, have some of the highest asthma rates, youth. But I think a quarter of youth in Newark have asthma. Um, and it's a combination of this trash incinerator, a uh, combination of the, uh, the port, um, big red truck traffic, um, and just other refineries in the area. Um, they literally burned trash from Essex County in this facility. Uh, and it wasn't up until only a few years ago, um, literally 10 years after they built this thing, that they started putting filters 
in it because finally uh, enough people have started uh, calling uh, their elected officials. Um, uh, it only produces power for 45,000 households. Essex County is a huge county, um, so there's there's really no reward from this uh, this thing. Um, and uh, yeah, it emits lead, emits mercury. Um, I don't think they really do a good job of getting out a lot of like tech waste um, and, 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 and such. Um, so just bad stuff. So Newark, uh, just some of the demographics, 36% Latino, 48% uh, Black African American. Um, so obviously a very diverse area that's being, uh, that is ground zero for uh, what we consider fossil fuel energy production. Um, so uh, long story short, uh, please take action. Uh, called Governor Murphy. Uh, Governor Murphy uh, has said he supports renewable energy. He says he wants to transition uh, New Jersey to 100% renewable by 2050. Uh, he says he wants to be carbon neutral by then as well. Um, but we want uh, him to, to put rhetoric to action. Um, so the Raritan Bay Pipeline and Compressor Station that I mentioned, it will be approved or denied by June 5th. Um, so if you get a chance, please call the governor and tell him to stop it. Uh, we only the clock's ticking really. We only have uh, less uh, a little bit over a month. Um, there is a statewide campaign to put a moratorium on these types of projects, uh, polluting uh, fossil fuel projects. EmpowerNewJersey.com. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, there's a lot of great resources there where you could uh, uh, lobby your elected officials and maybe even uh, take action and organize yourself. And um, and uh, yeah, please email them as well. Um, so that's that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Who shot the question? So I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear the response. To you. Obviously, you're advocating, and you know, legislate. You're you're in the faces of people. So, what is their response back? Like, what's the what are they saying? From the public or no, from the people. Oh, from our elected officials. Yeah. 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 So um, there are some legislative champions. Um, I can probably name them on one hand. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have gone in front of the governor and asked him to implement an emergency moratorium on fossil fuel infrastructure projects. So right uh, there, what was his response to that? He, you might have heard him say this. Uh, we are calling balls and strikes uh, on each of these projects. Uh, perhaps he's a baseball fan. Uh, I think that's what he means by that. He's, but we need him to be the umpire. We need him to uh, to stop these projects. If we're really going to get uh, New Jersey to 100% renewable energy, he needs to be the umpire and uh, and call strikes on these projects. Um, but it, the, again, the rhetoric isn't matching the action. There's already two projects that are being built as we speak: SRL pipeline and the Roseline compressor station. Um, so we just need to keep uh, calling his office. Thousands of people have already called Governor Murphy's office, uh, have called the NJ Department of Environmental Protection, uh, but we just really need a, a huge movement um, to uh, to stop these projects. I, I think, you know, from what I've read in, in social um, uh, social change uh, literature is that if we get 2% of the population uh, to take action, then elected officials are forced to change. Uh, so if we could get 2% of New Jerseyans to take action, then I have no, um, uh, I have no doubt that we could stop these projects. Linda? Well, my question is, for, I remember Little Silver, which is predominantly a white community in our area, and they wanted to have a cell phone tower in Little Silver. And there were signs all over, no cell phone tower, people protested, and there was no cell phone tower built in Little Silver. But should you be living in, perhaps, the black community in Long Branch and a cell phone town? A tower is proposed. I would think nine times out of ten that tower will be built. So, they don't so if you're living in a community, a minority community, and all of these different projects are proposed for your community, what what course of action should you take? I mean, if it is a predominantly white community, generally the people within that community are going to fight it, mm -hmm. and oftentimes win. Yeah. If you're living in a minority community, it's a different. Story. So, what action should be taken? 
so I, th I think you're referencing the JCPNL power. Yeah, this line. was a few yeah. years oh, ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so the one I know of is the JCPNL mm -hmm. power lines. This was um, cell phone. Okay. Related. But, but well, let's take it to the consideration of the JCPNL folks. JCPNL folks. Those communities were, you know, pretty affluent communities where they wanted to build these huge behemoth power lines, uh, monopole power lines through, and uh, ultimately. They did get hundreds of people out to hearings. They called uh, the Board of Public Utilities, which was mm -hmm. going to ultimately decide on this. They called the Governor Christie, and they made sure to get into King Governor Murphy's face while he was campaigning and asking he was governor. Um, so, uh, so, so you're right. For for an affluent Caucasian community, uh, we could see how they how they could organize and how they could style projects like like the, that JCPNL one. Um, it, you're right, I think you hit the nail on the head. The, uh, these polluting companies want to build power plants, garbage facilities, compressor stations, pipelines in uh, black and brown communities because they don't think that they vote, they don't think that they will make a ruckus. Um, and uh, a lot of the times it's a highly immigrant population and they're not gonna, uh, about, they're not about to go call the governor or storm, storm you know, a legislative office. Um, so, so it is a challenge. Uh, I think it's very important uh, when we're reaching out to communities to try to stop these projects that we speak in their language, um, that we uh, that we uh, don't just try to like umbrella ourselves into those communities, but we try to recruit folks from those communities to to give uh, presentations like I'm giving here, right? Like um, if they wanted to build. Um, a, uh, a trash incinerator in Chinatown in New York City, I would try to recruit someone from that community instead of myself, umbrella uh, in myself uh, into that community. So, um, so yeah, speak their language, uh, get folks from their community to take a leading role um, and, uh, and recruit their own uh, community members in the fight. So as an advocate and as a leader in this field, is that what you're doing? Uh, so I speak Spanish. Um, when I when we go to Spanish communities, um, uh, I think I I grew up in communities like that, and uh, and for the most part I, I do. Uh, I see my I I guess I am kind of umbrellaing myself, but at the same time I I've, I've been through what uh, a lot of people in New in Newark have gone through, uh, or even uh, some of the Latino population here in Red Bank. Uh, I, I I grew up in a community like that. Uh, However, if it's a culture that's totally different from uh, from one I've, I've grew up, grown up in, uh, then I, I wouldn't umbrella myself in. Um, that. Yeah. But you're, the, well, same, the presentation you're doing now, the training, the information, you're not in this community doing that? Uh, we do work uh, in Monmouth County. Uh, again, we, we help stop the, um, the Port Ambrose uh, liquid natural gas facility. They wanted to build it a few years ago. Food and Water Watch was involved in that fight as well as uh, other environmental groups, but they wanted to build it right offshore of Red Bank. Um, let, let me, let me, let me, let me try to If they're not organized, they need training in organizing. Well, let, so let, 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 it, 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 it's, it's very difficult to, to get action, but, but basically, uh, my experience, I, I was associated with the uh, Franciscans response to fracking, uh, and they had, uh, back when Tennessee gas pipeline was coming across the northern part of the state, there was also a project uh, in Susquehanna, Roseland, who was uh, building the big power lines from Pennsylvania uh, into New Jersey. Uh, that's also, Penn East is another example which the Air Club. But basically, uh, in a nutshell, you know, you're asking, you know, what, what can the community do? One is to get educated of the problem. Number two, write letters to the editor. You know, uh, I think uh, some of our Sierra Club Groups, you know, take a topic at their meeting, and everybody writes a handwritten letter and sends it to whoever they feel it should be addressed to, whether it be a legislature, whether it be the BPU, whether it be the governor, you know. But but you need to write, okay? Letters to the editor, uh, write, telephone calls. Uh, the uh, I'm trying to think, what is it? The Quakers have a very uh, uh, very <coughs> rigorous. Uh, presentation on uh, in course or instruction on, on how to lobby, you know, uh, how to prepare yourself and go in and talk to I, I guess my point is, and I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you, is that I know how to lobby, I know how to do what we're doing right. here, but these communities specifically don't. 
So where is the advocacy to train them? Like you're saying, we shouldn't speak for them, and I, I believe in that, but I feel like we should support them and make a ruckus if that's what we need to. True. But in the interim, they need to have their own training. <clears throat> they need organizations like you that know how to go in and teach them because they, you know, grassroots is the strongest, and I agree with you 100%. I come from a community where people are not politically involved, and you know there are people that support the community. But at the end of the day, it is better to teach the people yeah. in that community. So, so you know, <coughs> I have this issue with not you specifically, but like people talk and they you know they garner support, but it's not helping the people because they're not learning. Yeah. And no. if you're working three jobs, you know, mm -hmm. and you barely have time to see your family. It's hard to, to get involved yeah. in writing to the editor. That's why I'm holding, uh, well, just for your point, so for something like the Newark Incinerator, um, uh, we, Food and Water Watch helped uh, fight it when it was barely being proposed and urged them continuously to put filters in. But there are community organizations in Newark, like the Ironbound Community Corporation, uh, that are on the ground every day working. So, so I would say, you know, invest in those types of organizations that are that are in those communities, uh, like the Ironbound Community Corporation, or uh, or uh, communities that are working on the Jersey Shore, New Jersey Organizing Project. You know, another one that's good. Uh, so, so, so focus on those community, on those organizations that are, that are in there. That, that, that's an important point to, to build coalitions. Uh, I think the most, uh, in, in, in my nine or ten to fifteen years of experience, I think the uh, Pilgrim Pipeline, uh, the way they organized, uh, reached out, you know, social groups, golf clubs, uh, Elks clubs, moose clubs. Uh, churches, uh, everybody that would listen and sign up, you know, and, and they were able to, to get enough political pressure up along the route for all the communities to, to approve resolutions opposing Pilgrim Pipeline and, and eventually, you know, combination of delaying actions, political support, uh, for all practical purposes, they, they defeated that. It's, I mean, it's important, you know, but, but I agree 100% with you, it's, it's, it's hard to do that, you know, but you have to have a dedication. I, I think yeah. if I can interject with the, this topic, one of the important things to remember is that everything starts at, at a certain point. You know, a meeting like this can be that point. A community organization can be that point. And it's bringing the, the, the people together. Education is a big component of that. People's willingness to continue through is a big component of that, but it's different in every community. There's, I, I think, I, I, you know, gentlemen, please correct me if, if you think I'm wrong. Every community is different. What works in every community is also going to be different. So you have to look at it from the perspective of what are you attempting to accomplish. There are organizations in every community. This could be a start here for something in Red Bank. It also could be a start for some surrounding towns that would like a similar series. That would like to organize. So you have to look at it. What what are we attempting to accomplish, and where do we go to to get that? And those infrastructures, as, as, as was just listed out, are in place. The community yeah, groups are in place. It's, I, it's a matter of reaching them and organizing them. Yes. An excellent example of a coalition that's really been effective, and it's just recent, is a rally for Navasek when the river was getting degraded and it got the water quality got downgraded. Uh, it was clean ocean action sort of spearheaded, but they got all kinds of organizations together and put a lot of pressure on a lot of people and especially got the DEP to come in, do additional testing and got community members to be uh, citizen scientists and do water testing. Uh, and it's really, really worked out quite well. And that's a good example of coalition. Yeah, yeah and I think it's, uh, again, pardon my interruption, I think it's a great example of very different communities along the Navasic. Red Bank is not like Rumson, and we're not like Tinton Falls, and we're not like Middletown. All of them are in that coalition together on working toward this common goal because we're all part of the river community. 
I think that's what I meant. Like, I feel like we need to speak up for these communities. So when you said, I don't want to umbrella them, I think we should umbrella them. I think that because we have more power and voice. I do have, I do have an opinion on that. There's, there's actually a big rift within the environmental community uh, between environmental know. justice uh, organizations that, that just work on environmental justice, right? Like the ones I mentioned, the one I mentioned in Newark, uh, the environmental, New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, and I, I think if they were here, they, they would probably oppose uh, that, the umbrella being, uh, because they, they truly feel that. It, it's, unfortunately in the environmental community, um, we're known, national groups are known to just parachute, uh, just like on political campaigns, you know, you'll see a bunch of out-of-towners coming into town, maybe you've experienced that on a campaign you've worked on, but it's the same thing for environmental uh, justice, right? Out of towners, maybe they're uh, white people that maybe young white people who are not familiar with local politics, local issues, and they. Unfortunately, I don't want to. I don't want to turn anyone off by saying this, but it's a it's a white savior complex uh, many of the times. I just um, mean as far as contacting politicians. That's yeah, uh, I I think it's maybe more better to just offer folks the, the training uh, to to make leader to create leaders in those communities. Uh, instead of us, we can parachute in and train, but I don't think we should parachute in and, and take over uh, organizing. And, and a, a point on that that I wanted to throw in, there was a, shortly after the 2016 election, some of the Monmouth Democrats had a what the hell happened meeting, and uh, people were sitting around and talking about knocking on doors before the election um, in places like uh, Asbury Park. And they, they knock on the say, we'd really like you to come out for the Democrats. And, and one, one man said, I had several people say to me, the only time I hear from you is when you're having an election. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, when it is someone coming in and telling you to do this, it doesn't sound like they have an investment in your community. You know, it might reduce your effectiveness, um, which doesn't say you don't try, but you know, there, there might be more effective ways of doing that. And, and I, 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 I agree with that. I need, I need, um, I find that the most successful campaigns, you know, uh, for local issues is the grassroots. And you know, a lot of people say, well, use your uh, internet and, uh, and uh, some of your social media. Uh, but uh, the studies that I've seen in the past couple of years, uh, pick up the phone, call on your neighbor or friend and invite them to a meeting seems to be the most effective way of getting grassroots support, you know, even if they don't show up to your meeting, they become appreciative that they were asked, and when they do that, then they start getting involved, you know, and all of a sudden the neighborhood starts talking about it. Very simple. Yes. Um, I don't want to sidestep away from what I think is the, the most important issue tonight, which is how to um, assist communities that are targeted for all of these environmental pollutants to um, increase their voice that I do think is the most important issue tonight but I have a question that I need clarification on one of your last slides with the um, Newark um, incineration plant it started off by saying it's about to get a lot cleaner and it makes the point at the bottom of your slide to talk about things that they were going to do to decrease all of those things that you were reading out. Did they not do that? Or did you just ignore the fact that they did do that to point out how terrible it was? Because it obviously started out pretty terrible. But that, was a, that looked like um, a flyer that was put out by the plant. It even had the name of the plant manager on it, yeah. and it had features that they were going to um, institute to make yeah. things better. And, and if you Did signed, that ever happen? Yeah, if you signed in, maybe we'll make sure to get folks the slides. But uh, in short, 10 years after they built this thing, uh, they finally decided to put filters in. Uh, after mass protests, uh, uh, in front of Covanto, which is uh, so that's what like, that slide was talking yeah. about. Those filters, they, it, I believe, it was 2014. So okay. for the last uh, five years of its 19-year history, they they put filters in, but it's still you're you can drive down the turnpike and you'll still smell. Oh, I, that's people I live with every day. You know? People live 
within a mile of that uh, Cobanza facility, and they, they breathe that every day. So uh, they, what they really got rid of is just like uh, particulate matter, uh, but the, the gases are still coming out. But, so what they did, they just got a bunch of plastic bags uh, that uh, can grab the particulate matter. Uh, so what are the organizations in. doing? Iron Bound to... Community Corp was actually instrumental in helping get those filters. I mean, they but support I mean, closing since it, is, it isn't enough, we That's need to close it down. Now. Right. We need I, the way we're going to close it down is by putting a moratorium on incinerators, uh, and that's only something that the governor can do, uh, or the state legislature can pass a bill where the governor signs. Um, but those are really the only two really legal options. And then what happens to the need well, that made them build it in the first place? The need was, uh, if you'll remember, there was a proposal a few years ago to build trash incinerators in every county in New Jersey. Um, I forget when it was, but it wasn't too long ago. And then white affluent communities pushed back and they said, let's build one in York, let's build one in Camden. Um, uh, there's another Trenton. There's, lo and behold, there's a black communities. But uh, if, if there is a moratorium put on that. Then we'll stop it. The, but then what happens yeah. to the need that created them in the first place? The trash doesn't disappear. You're right, but we also are. So what's the solution, yeah. is what I'm saying. We, we all... can say stop it, yeah. but then what alternative do we have? Uh, the same thing I think maybe half this room or more is doing already. Uh, reducing, reducing your use of, uh, just okay, throw, so throw away. It gets kicked back yeah, to so, the individual. But, but this, is how the, this is how people in affluent communities right, can use their, their influence. Um, maybe someone in this room knows the governor. Uh, he doesn't live that far from here, actually. Uh, uh, maybe someone knows an elected official that is close to the governor. Maybe someone has donated to the governor uh, and he's willing to hear you out. Uh, governor or powerful elected official. So, so the, or call the governor. Anyone from the state can call the governor. Uh, get 10 of your friends to call the governor uh, in a community that may not be as politically active and may not make as many phone calls. Uh, so this is how we can supplement uh, uh, perhaps what's the political activism that's lacking in in communities of color. Yeah, uh, yeah I just have a, a question and kind of a comment, and it's kind of coming from a lack of knowledge, but maybe just maybe you can clarify. So I know that if you want to do something on your own property, you have to go through hoops in your own township. I had a neighbor who wanted to subdivide her property. There was a tiny stream. She couldn't do it because it was wetlands, okay? And that's just on a local level. So you had that slide up of, of these 12 power plants and the gas compressors. Those projects are done, or some of them already exist. So none, none of the ones up here have, have are operational. Okay. Some of them are being constructed, not operational. Okay. So, so my question is this: so, if some of these power plants and whatever, if there are known carcinogens that are into the earth, what at what point is it? Do, does any government agency say, yeah, no problem, just build it, build it? If you can't even do something on a local level in your own property, I just don't understand. Money. How? Money. Yeah. 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 Money.
uh, you've taken $300 million out of money that could have been put to renewables and put it in nuclear. But notwithstanding that, if you put your money in wind and generate the electricity, then a lot of these plants aren't necessary. Even the ones in New York. I think I think New York has a goal of something like 9,000 megawatts, uh, something. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount. It's like triple what uh, what the New Jersey ones. But if, if the wind goes in there, then you don't uh, need all that gas to generate electricity. And from the consumer standpoint, my argument is is that natural gas is used by about 70 percent of the residents for heating. Well, if you eliminate the demand for the electricity, then that's going to make your residential heating cheaper too. And then all that money gets fed back in. So just to add on that, that currently the Department of Environmental Protection does not um, regulate climate. They don't take climate change into consideration. This is something that the governor and the legislature should work on to, uh, to put into New Jersey law. Whenever a project like this comes up, whether it's an incinerator, power plant, compressor station, the climate change impacts are taken into effect. Well, uh, I, think, I think the law is there. They just haven't developed the regulation. And, uh, and air quality as well. So taking uh, uh, the DP has already issued perm an air permit for the Metal Lines power plant in North Bourbon. They've already issued an air permit for the uh, Raritan Bay pipeline and Franklin compressor station. Um, so they're obviously not doing something right. Uh, they're not taking air impacts into consideration. What they what they will say is that okay, air will be affected in this community, but we're going to plant a thousand trees uh, somewhere, uh, maybe not even in New Jersey, uh, somewhere else, uh, and that will offset uh, what the air impacts. And that, and that's the other thing. I have never seen a project stop solely on environmental mm -hmm. issues. You know, because the way the law is written, you know, you go back and, and if you're going to damage something, then you have an op the, the, the polluter has an opportunity to propose some remediation. Prime example of that is when, when they built the Tennessee gas pipeline, uh, they uh, they went over the mountain and uh, caused a lot of erosion and whatnot. And, and deal was, okay, I'm going to plant trees, you know, well, they planted trees, but that spring they all washed out, you know, and they planted trees again, and they all washed out, you know, and, and then they stopped planting trees, mm -hmm. and we've got a big ravine, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the other the other example is, is uh, uh, BLA, you know, here they, they're put in the, the Southern Liability Link to service the gas, well, BL England decided not to do that, okay? But the gas companies still want that pipeline in, and so now they've changed, and they're actually suing uh, the Pilots Commission uh, to basically allow them to, you know, not reverse their decision, you know? It's, it's, just, it's just that the way the environmental regulations and laws are set, it's just, it's just so hard. Yeah. Yes. Um, if you just both just touch a little bit more on like the rebuttal from the economic standpoint of like, oh, this will be creating jobs or whatever the other argument is, or, or how you can kind of pose that in a in a way that will show like, okay, well, that may like the environmental impact is going to outweigh whatever the short term economic um, like. The, 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 yeah, I, 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 got, I get people that are, get all frustrated because these union guys, pipe fitters, come in and, and uh, they, they give their spill and they don't even wait for an answer, they just walk out the door, you know, because they're lined up because jobs, jobs, jobs for those pipe fitters and they do that for any project, whether it's windmills, which would produce more jobs, okay, in terms of what they do. Uh, Particularly here in New Jersey, we have about four or five sites that uh, the harbors and ports uh, that are going to be needed to uh, assemble these windmills and, and, and ship them out to sea and before they do that. And millions of dollars are going to get invested, you know, to do that. You know, uh, there are alternatives. Uh, the other thing I saw a statistic. One of the one of the advantages of uh, a microgrid is not only the fact that it's more resilient, which is 
important to us because we're going to get hit by uh, by hurricanes and whatnot. But it's also easier to secure. They talk about secure grid. Uh, there's a lot of different advantages uh, to that. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that the, the estimate that the uh, civil engineers would come up is going to take about 476 million dollars to do that. Billions. But it's going to get two trillion dollars of advantage, you know, because it's cheaper to operate over the long term. The same thing with uh, a lot of the, uh, these projects. Uh, coal is now more expensive uh, to produce than any of the renewable energies, uh, and they're projecting that in the next five to, to, to six years, renewables will be cheaper than these new gas plants in terms of the levelized cost of uh, electricity. So what I'm saying is, is that the upfront cost, uh, which is what's hurting the renewables and the clean energy advocates, uh, if you have a, a longer return on investment, it would give you that return on investment. And that's the argument that I would make. You know, the other thing is, is that the labor used for that uh, actually produces more jobs than it would be for the fossil fuel. So in short, these are our, our union brother sisters, um, and uh, they have families. You know, we, we can't chide them for for building an oil pipeline or building a gas pipeline or building a compressor station. They got to put food on their table. Um, but uh, we can certainly usher in a, a green uh, energy revolution that will uh, talk about the jobs uh, uh, that, that we can get building offshore wind off of every mile of coastline here in Jersey. Uh, getting rid of uh, barriers for people to put solar on their home, uh, uh, so more m more money that people get uh, back. Uh, there's a cap currently in New Jersey. Uh, we should eliminate that cap or raise it uh, exponentially, um, so folks have more incentives to put, to put solar on their home. Um, uh, we should, uh, in a green energy revolution, we need to make sure that these are union jobs uh, in this transition. Um, I've also been at hearings with pipe fitters and. And, uh, and carpenter unions, and uh, and they're always advocating for these short-term jobs that are really just construction jobs. I'm building this 23-mile pipeline in the Raritan Bay will create 100 jobs. Uh, the jobs will last one year, and then they have to move on to another project. Those aren't sustainable jobs. We can have sustainable jobs in taking care of windmills, um, uh, building solar panels. Let's build them here in the U.S., um, uh, putting them on people's homes, um, and, uh, and other geothermal, um, hydroelectric, just so many opportunities for renewables. Um, so uh, on the job aspect, we can push back, we have the numbers, they're short-term jobs, they're not sustainable jobs. Uh, we can have much more sustainability in green energy jobs. The, the, other, the other thing I'd like to point out is we have a decaying infrastructure and Congress is going to be talking about infrastructure so you and, and they're talking about four or five trillion dollars are needed just to replace the infrastructure that's broken. The question is, is do you want to rebuild what's broken now and come up with the same problems? Or do you want to take that and, and invest it in something that's more sustainable? Right. And that, and that's the issue. Uh, IOC, the, the GEO advocates the Green New Deal. You know, we're going to pay for it either way. You're either paid for it for a better society, or you're going to pay for the cost of, of, of living in a crappy society. Simple as that. So, what do, just with, we have a fair amount of young people here tonight. What do you recommend to the young people who are inheriting this whole mess that they do? I mean, rather I mean, than I, look to you to say, were, well, what are you doing? If I were a young kid, I would sign up with the Sunrise. If you're interested in climate change, if you're interested in building a better future, if you're interested in environment justice, environmental justice, a young person get involved because I, I've been associated with that. I'm an old guy, young at heart. That I'll tell you, they are very organized. Sunrise Movement. Sunrise Movement. Sunrise movement .org. Right here. Right here. Right here is the man. Right here. Right here is right right my other New Jersey for. For, for three months, I was the only Sunrise Movement organizer in the state of New Jersey, and then all of a sudden, Alex popped in there. And I'll tell you, his group is doing fantastic.
Go ahead, say something else. Okay, yeah, I don't want to steal the show. Steal the show. Okay. <laughs> steal the show. Okay. Steal the show. <laughs> steal the show. Okay. No problem. No problem. Great. Okay. <laughs> Summer. Summer, you should come too. Okay. Okay. So, we'll get you on the video. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> oh, you have the video? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, I just want to make sure um, everyone who's here can have a chance to share some of their thoughts. So, as um, was alluded to before, there was not any kind of presence with the Sunrise Movement. And for those of you who aren't aware, there is a youth-led initiative to institute the Green New Deal on a mass scale through investing in millions of high-paying jobs, investing in our infrastructure, repairing and replacing um, unsustainable energy grids and energy infrastructure. And so I ended up meeting up with a former congressional candidate, Jim Keady, in New York City, where the Sunrise Movement did have a meeting. And we were talking, and we said, well, why don't we just create a Sunrise Jersey Shore hub? Because these issues are relevant to people who saw their basements flood during Hurricane Sandy. They saw tens of thousands of dollars of their property destroyed. And so the way I see it is that the Green New Deal focuses on the economic aspect of it, but also incorporates the theme of tonight's event, which is the environmental and, um, I guess, uh, the justice that component that gets left out of so many conversations where communities of color are disproportionately affected based off of the infrastructure, um, you know, zip codes that, you know, end up displacing folks as well as, you know, not providing the property values and the retention of wealth. Uh, those kinds of infrastructure projects are not reinvested into the community. And so uh, I'd like for Summer, one of the co-chairs, to say a few words too. But we have a town hall on Friday, May 10th at 7 p.m. at the campus Macedonia Baptist Church. And this is a discussion about the principles of House Resolution 109, which is going to be the most comprehensive solution to the climate crisis. And uh, what has been mentioned here before, like what are ways that you can get involved in Red Bank? Well, I think that the town hall would be an amazing opportunity for every one of you sitting here, regardless of how young you are, regardless of how old you are, regardless whether or not you own a beachfront property or you're not you know, at risk of property damage and loss of life. We just want to have a discussion about these ideas. Well, I wish I was prepared to say something. So I'm a little That's shy. Okay. That's okay. I don't really have anything to add. You kind of covered everything. <laughs> okay. Well, so essentially, um, the Sunrise Movement is really about like youth leaders kind of just like stepping up. And I had no background in environmental activism. I just thought that this resolution um, that has co-sponsorships across you know all these different states, a lot of people have stepped up to the plate. Um, Summer and I serve as co-chairs, and so we are really trying to kind of reach out to different communities within the uh, Jersey Shore area. And so um, if all of you have a Facebook, our group is known as Sunrise Jersey Shore. That's the name of our hub. We are on Instagram as Sunrise Jersey Shore. We are on Twitter as Sunrise Jersey Shore. But if you all have the calendars on your phone, please feel free to include on Friday, May 10th at 7 p.m. at the campus Macedonia Baptist Church, 1924 Heck Avenue, Neptune City, New Jersey, will be an open discussion. And I'm really excited because it does specifically take place at um, a place of worship that is predominantly uh, attended by people of color. And I think that that's where this conversation belongs. It doesn't belong in middle class neighborhoods. It belongs in the communities that are like in the working poor, those that are struggling because the impacts of, you know, just blindsiding are these Are those people have... going to be participating and speaking at that, 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 that yeah. um, I town hall meeting? Right, so what we have our now, panelists. That's the question. Are they uh -huh. going to be speaking? Are they going to be participating? Are they going to be leading? some of the discussion points, because I've, I've gone to a, a gazillion things, and, well, not a gazillion, maybe a million, all right? And there is talk about environmental justice for people of color, but people of color are not leading and they're not speaking, all right? Um, and I need to put that out there, and, and I'm dead serious about it. Um, we might, there might be a few in the audience, um, a few people, but you got you got to get us involved. We have to be up there on that podium. We have to be participating and co-leading with what you're doing. I'm just gonna say it. Yeah. I said, who was that crazy lady with the glasses on? No, no. It needs to be said. Yeah. Be said. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can go ahead. 
one way you can do that is involve the leaders of the black churches. And there are some who are only interested in that religious component, but there are others that are highly involved in doing something for the community and get the community. For a white person to come in one more time, forget it. Yeah. Right. So to give everybody context, the Sunrise Movement the Jersey Shore Hub has existed for about three months. So this is not about reinventing the wheel. It's about implementing um, this structure of a town hall that has existed in other uh, parts of the uh, other parts of the country. So Boston, for example, the city council passed a resolution to support um, the Green New Deal and to support all of this investment in economic security as well as infrastructure and you know wind turbines, um, offshore wind, uh, off offshore power sources. It's like this really comprehensive focus. Um, but to I j address your question head on, um, as someone who's not a person of color, I haven't walked the walk. So I grew up not worrying about whether or not my water was contaminated. I grew up not worrying whether or not, um, you know, I felt safe, you know, with those kinds of public resources that I just take for granted. It's just I haven't experienced that. And on my end, it takes time to foster those relationships, and it's a, it's a factor of like mutual trust. So. You don't, you don't know who I am, like we, we just interacted now for the first time, but I can tell you that the doors to our town hall are open specifically to the folks that want to have this open conversation. Well, we have our panelists, and we have people who have worked in various facets of the environmental justice movement. In fact, Junior Romero is one of our panelists, which is a really exciting component, is like Food and Water Watch is going to be present. Sustainable Jersey, which is a statewide coalition to promote sustainable practices, is going to be there. Uh, we are. It's it's very difficult sometimes to secure panelists with you know scheduling, but we were able to potentially have um, you know someone from NJDEP who's a woman of color, but we don't have her secured, so I can't say for certain we're going to have you know representation from all different facets and backgrounds. Is this but primarily a black church. It is. Yeah, so it's a Baptist church. Is the, yeah, the most important thing we have to do right now in the coming weeks is outreach actually in that community. So it's not a bunch of, you know, people from like predominantly white communities coming to see this event. You know, we have to do outreach in that town specifically. So, so that helps answer. Thank you very much. We only have a few minutes left, so I know there were a couple other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you had your hand up an hour ago and say let me, let me, let me yeah. just, just let me add that to answer the question about how did young people get together. My recommendation is to go with the Sunrise Movement. I think they're very well organized, uh, and particularly in this area. He's, he's doing a fantastic job. Uh, we, uh, the New Jersey Sierra Club has a high school organization. You can go to our website and you get that point of contact. Uh, there's a, uh, another organization, it's called the New Jersey Student Sustainability Coalition. Uh, that's managed by high schoolers. Uh, and I think Anaya, is Anaya Singh associated with your group, Alex? Anaya Singh? Yeah, so Anaya Singh is- Yeah, Anaya Singh is, is uh, she lives up in my neck of the woods. Yeah. But like, but she, she's an organizer for, for that along with uh, a number of other, I think it's, it's people from Morris, Morris County in that area, but they have many chapters and organizations all across the state. But those are the three, three that I would recommend. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to add one thing. One another component when it involves energy, uh, gas pipelines, and pumping stations, and energy-related things is the federal agency that approves projects, which is what is called a captured agency. It's, it's FERC, Federal Energy, uh, whatever they're. Rubber Stamp Commission. Yeah. yeah and the people on that board, and it's like a lot of boards, but well, BPU is not as bad as now, but, but there are people from the industry that are running. And, and so this, the, the internet is completely political. 
FERC was organized back in the 20s when it was believed that big corporations had the answer for everything. Right. And, and so all their regulations are founded based on that to service. And basically it was set up to override state authorities. Simple as that. It should be abolished as far as I'm concerned. It's not going to Yes. There's just one more thing. I think we, we must not forget. I'm very much in favor of of grassroots uh, community work. I'm involved in quite a bit myself. However, for every call we make on behalf of our community, we better make also one or two calls on a more global, on a more federal issue. We got to support that. The EPA has become a joke. Yeah. So unless we do that, then it's, then it's always NIMBY. Don't do it in my yard, just send it somewhere else. That's not the answer. The answer might very well be, do we need a bloody incinerator? Or are there some more intelligent ways of, of taking care of the problem? So one approach we take in community organizing, and more interestingly enough, I see it kind of the other way, right? Like people are very uh, inflamed national with national politics they are more than willing to make a call to their congress member um, uh, to uh, to a uh, you know res resignation of the EPA uh, administrator uh, and and they don't always take into look the local issues uh, so so actually I've, I've kind of seen it conversely where uh, where we're paying attention to what's happening at the federal level or not even looking at what's happening like how many folks knew all these 12 pipelines and power plants or being approved right now. They're gonna be approved or denied in the next year or two. Um, so I, I kind of see it conversely, but you're right, we should, uh, for every uh, national call we make, we should make a local call, right? I, I'll see it conversely. Um, but anyways, uh, organizing on local issues, uh, I've been in rooms where it's been half Republicans, half Democrats, half, you know, nonpartisan. Um, organizing on local issues and then talking about climate change in those meetings uh, talking about water issues, talking about air issues. That's how you build that arc towards towards getting them on our side, on, okay. on a progressive environmental uh, future. So um, so it's all about building art arcs for folks who, who aren't with us now. Um, and that's that's a lot of the work that, that, that we do across New Jersey and across the state, uh, the country. Thank you so much. Yeah. I also okay. just want to say there is a movie that the library has recently purchased. It's called The Seed. It is fabulous. It, it's called The Seed, and it talks about what's happening to the seeds in our country and the world, actually. Most of them are being modified. 93% of all seeds in this country are um, modified. I really recommend seeing this movie. And, uh, um, it will give you some real insight into the food industry. <laughs> yeah, it's not, well, this is very anti Monsanto. <laughs> and down <laughs> That's what I do. Well, thank thank you I'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening. Please follow up, watch yourself on the video later. And we have the survey for the Environmental Commission uh, slash library series. Please indicate your preferences and have a great evening.